just very briefly, I'm going to describe like three main ecosystems in Peru. You have the whole costa, or the coastal zone, which is in, in yellow, which is basically like in California, it's kind of like a, a desert, uh, and kind of like a low rain. They have a little bit of fog, but not much uh, uh, vegetation going there. Then the Sierra is, is what is in here in brown. It's basically the Andes. And here the Andes is not just one single range. It has like a, a three different ranges. So you have these valleys where most of the people established themselves in the past, all the Incas and the Aboriginals, and they are very fertile. So that's basically what most of the population um, started in Peru. And then, of course, you have the Selva, which is literally the eastern part, the western part of the Amazon, with very uh, low population, which is good, so it is mostly preserved, except for some areas. And here you have basically what it is, the, the, the Sierras, which is the Andes over here, and then the Amazon with a very flat, very low uh, elevation. The highest elevation is the Huascaran, which is around this area near Huaraz, and we're gonna see some uh, pictures of it. It's about 20,000 feet in elevation, 6,700 uh, meters. So uh, on, on, on all my tours, when I did the scouting tour, of course, I started in Lima and I went up, and then, you know, I was I didn't know which way to go uh, when I was gonna when I was planning for these tours, and then I found out that the best way is to start way from the north, which is from Chiclayo, and literally we cross the Andes five times, mm. back and forth, back and forth, and we end up in, in Cusco. Anyway, around Chica around Chiclayo, you can see this uh, deciduous forest, and that's basically what it looks like. There are some espostoa which is the colonna cactus with the lateral cephalium. And also all those trees are deciduous. So during the dry season, they lose their leaves. And then in the rainy season, uh, they, uh, they leave out. Uh, Erythrina, it's a very common uh, genus that goes from Mexico all the way down to South America with the different species. It's the same as the coral tree that you have here, <coughs> which is Erythrina cristadalis. And like I said, there's a lot of cactus in this area, brown India altissima, and of course, mellow cactus. Most of the mellow cactus, they grow in Brazil, but the mellow cactus, they reach all the way up to Cuba and all the way down to Paraguay and Bolivia, uh, with only two species in Peru <coughs> that have been uh, split, so there's a lot of names, but uh, that's basically one of them. So the first time I visited this, I wasn't that impressed and I said, well, it's just probably an acne or something like that. It's not, it's actually a Chilancia. And it was one member from here that says, hey, that's Chilancia Hill Day. Uh, her name is uh, Kei Kihara, which uh, some of you might know. She was a, a member from this uh, thing, and she traveled with me, and she goes, that's a very nice uh, Chilancia. I didn't know that it grew here. So that's a good thing about traveling with people that know that you learn from them. Um, and then after that, you can teach uh, others if they show you plants. Deuteroconia longipetala, it's a widespread species that goes all the way up to Ecuador and all the way down to Argentina. It's a very, very common uh, bromelia. Mm -hmm. These are some of the mellow cactus. You can see some forest of them in some locations. Racinia is a genus that is common in Ecuador and, uh, and Peru. Racinia multiflora and Racinia fraseri. Like you said, I need more good pictures. <laughs> I think they're quite old. It's a famous bridge that we go, every time we go there, we cross this bridge, you can see Christy and uh, Nancy over there. I don't know who the people in the back are. Pam, uh, Pam is there. Is, is that Pam? Pam Quiggy in purple. Okay, so it is one from the recent trips. And you can see this wall, this is the, the, the river, is the Utcubamba River, and this is the Utcubamba Valley. Uh, new species have been discovered here all the time, including some large cacti. And a lot of Chilancias grow over here. These are fairly large uh, plants, about three, four feet in diameter. What, what uh, time of the year was that? Uh, I usually go in August, September, uh, for a reason that I'm gonna explain afterwards. <laughs> um, but September is, of course, it's the spring in, in South America, south of the equator. <coughs> and they're just coming into bloom. Mm -hmm. Chilancia carnosa, fairly common. 
and widespread along this valley. This is one of the largest uh, Tillandsias in Peru, Tillandsia ferrere, with very nice purple flowers. This, these plants are very, very large. The inflorescence must be five or six uh, foot tall. And you can see the vegetation all around is very, very tropical, very dense, but also at about uh, two to 3,000 feet in elevation. More Tilanza carnosa. Uh, Tilanza scabinea, widespread. In some cases, it grows in dry areas. It was fairly humid. Tilanza distica, different forms of it. What you see on the left is Tilanza rawi that has been changed out. Tilanza flavellata. These are all grow in the same, exactly in the same area, almost on the same tree. <coughs> and there you have Tilansia guarneriana, which, which used to be called Brisia rawi. It's this one here, and it's this plant here. I think I do have a better picture of it. Yeah. A beautiful plant. I'm not sure, is this in cultivation? I have no yeah. idea. Uh, quite a few Pitcanias in, in Peru. There's more in Ecuador, of course. This is a Pitcania paniculata. And this, I believe, is Pitcania echinata. I only saw this plant on just one trip, so I do not have better pictures of it. Another Pitcania. And of course, you're going to see a lot of orchids in this uh, area, which is uh, very humid. And the trees next to the uh, to the river are loaded with this uh, Tillandsia, most of them Tillandsia carnosa. This is a new species that was recently described. It's Postora cumbambensis, <laughs> and you can see a Tillandsia tovarensis growing right here in the middle of the plant middle of the cactus. More Tillandsia straminea in bloom. Is it Cacticola? I think Cacticola, yeah, it's very similar. I'll show Cacticola later. And you can see some of the roads. Here we are at about probably five, 6,000 feet. Uh, it is uh, usually cloudy or foggy in the morning, but a great place to scout for plants. Where? And at our elevation, we see, of course, Puya, Puya Glauco virens. And even though it looks a little scary, we're going to be going all the way down this valley, which is uh, the Marañón Valley, or the Marañón River, it's all the way down here. And then we're going to be going up this road on the other side. It looks scary, but it's uh, fairly wide. Sometimes you have to cross with uh, uh, big trucks. And just a photo of the flowers of the Puya. Uh, this is a very nice talk, uh, Tillandsia curvispica. Tillandsia curvispica is this one here in the back. And as you can see, the actual, the inflorescence, they kind of curve and they spiral. And that's where the name is from. Uh, growing together some uh, matucana. And the one on the left is Tillandsia spiraliflora. Is the flower always all white? Yes, whitish. Mm -hmm. The bracts are whitish, yeah. This is a beautiful plant, so you can see the, the, the I mean, if the, the, the leaves are quite dark, kind of burgundy, and they're almost white. What's about the elevation on that? that that's on, on this Tillandsia, we are above the Marañón River, probably about 5,000 feet, yeah. maybe 6,000 feet. Because it's right under where you find the Puya. So about five to 6,000 feet. And you drop all the way down to about 800 feet, which is where the Marañón River is. Uh, this is a Peperomia, which is a genus that is fairly common in, uh, in Peru. And this is a very nice one that will look very nice on a, on a bonsai pot. 
So here we are all the way down to the Maranao River. It gets very warm, it gets very, very hot over here, mainly because we are at very low elevation, and the Maranao River is one of the uh, biggest affluents of the Amazon. But it crosses Peru from north to south, and then it heads uh, east towards the Amazon River. As you can see, there's less bromeliads here, more cacti. There's Pastoa, Braningia, and this is the road that we came from on the other side, all the way down to the Marañón River, and now we are on the other side of the river. As you can see, the land uh, has been uh, very altered here by, uh, by the local population, but still quite a bit of uh, habitat, especially when it gets a little steep. You still find some uh, uh, natural habitats with, uh, with some bromeliads. And that's what the road looks like. <laughs> it looks worse than what it is. Uh, I was surprised the first time to see actually an Echeveria over there. Uh, as you might know, Echeveria very, very common in Mexico, but there's uh, quite a few in South America, just you know, not that many species. Uh, there's about three or four in Peru, and they reach all the way down to Argentina with two or three species. There's some in Bolivia that we also detected on one of the trips. And even though this picture was taken 12 years ago, the sign over here says internet. So that was the internet <laughs> cafe for the, for the area. I guess this lady was checking emails. <laughs> we see a Hansiana. Not that many plants, but uh, widely distributed. So basically, well, from Chiclayo, we went all the way up to a little bit of the Marañón River. So we were on this part and we're coming back to Cajamarca. So we're already crossing the Andes back. Cajamarca is a beautiful city. It's probably the third largest city in Peru, after Lima and uh, I forgot the name of the, and Arequipa in the south. So very uh, nice colonial architecture. As you can see, it's been uh, well preserved in the downtown areas. And you do find a lot of uh, Aboriginal populations still in the highlands. And as you can see, areas that are flat have been uh, uh, very disturbed. So if you want to look for cacti, you have to find it on the rocks. Here, Tillandsia macbradiana, variety longifolia. I have better pictures of it growing together with uh, cacti, macucana. and a better picture of the Tulancia Macradiana. How far are you from the uh, Pacific at this point? Uh, we're still pretty far, about 300 miles, 300 on, a, miles. on a straight line. So, so you, you don't, you don't get any fog. Cl clouds in the afternoon? No, no, no. Not, not here. This it's is just, far this is high elevation, so high you, still, you still get the, the cool from the high elevation, but no, okay. no fog at this point. And as you can see, there's many different forms with uh, some of the bracts more red, some more pink. Another uh, Tillandsia that grows here, one of the few with the uh, yellow flower, Tillandsia humilis, which is widely distributed. It's sometimes hard to find it with, uh, in flower. That's a very, very old picture. Uh, Tillandsia tectorum, also a widespread species. Some some people divide this into many different species or subspecies. Uh, you can see this one is with very, very narrow leaves. If you go and see the ones from Ecuador uh, near uh, Cuenca, they are very compact, thick leaves, more like a succulent leaves. So quite a variable species. And like I said, there's a book just on Tectorum, uh, whatever group, uh, with many different uh, names for them. Lancia extensa, a fairly large plant. Very, very uncommon. It's hard to find this plant. On some trips, we don't find it. A very large inflorescence. This is what I have as Tillandsia cacticola. And very similar to Scraminea. And I guess the difference is on the bracts uh, overlapping or not overlapping. Then some of the architecture in these uh, small towns. Tilancia Dudley, 
also not very uh, common to find it in bloom. And this is one of my favorite puyas. It's a very tight uh, puya, maybe uh, uh, 10 inches in diameter. It doesn't get much uh, bigger than that. Tilans apuya medica. And this is the place that it grows on this little uh, rocky outcrops. And it's almost a black flower, really deep purple flowers. <laughs> and Pictania punhems. Now the lady that you see on the back, every time that I come to this place, she comes and visit. And of course, it's been over oh, 12 or 15 years since the first time I've been. So the kids are all grown up now. <laughs> and uh, on one time, this is the lady. Now the kids are uh, the 10, 12. Mm -hmm. Some of them. I took this picture and on the uh, following trip, I actually made a, a, a big print out of it and I put it on a frame and I gave it to them and they were really, really excited. And then uh, this is a, a very nice Echeveria. On the scouting trip, I was with uh, Kelly Griffin and he's into Dahlias and Echeveria. So we were really looking for this. We had the book on Echeveria by Pilby and uh, Kelly was driving. Uh, <laughs> It's not a good experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but since it was a dirt road, I said, okay, Kelly, you can drive now. Uh, but anyway, I was reading, and I go, and I, I look at the description of this, and I said, oh, it's growing on a fence. Uh, I guess they didn't get to the actual population of this. And I look up, and there it was, right on a mud wall. It wasn't a fence, it was a wall about five, six feet tall. And uh, so I said, stop, stop, stop. And uh, so anyway, I talked to this lady and I said, would you give us a, a ladder so we can take pictures because it was falling right on this fence. And there is Kelly showing the pictures and she goes, oh yeah, I remember a couple of gringos coming here and they asked me for the same thing. They wanted to take pictures of this plant. And uh, she described where they got the plant from. Anyway, she, she wanted me to marry one of the daughters. <laughs> I, I've been back several times and every, every time I go, uh, you know, I, I used to, when they have no many restrictions bringing stuff, uh, people will bring clothes and stuff like that, and uh, she will distribute them among relatives and people nearby. But anyway, every time I go, I, I'd like to stop and say hello. And this is her posing, this is not, doing. she's sorting out the, you know, Indian potatoes. But she's, she literally, she said, oh, you can take a picture of me doing, uh, posing on the, with the Indian potatoes. But anyway, it's, it's, it's nice to come back and actually see the, the same people from many different trips. So we were here in Cajamarca, we're still in the northern part, and we're going to be dropping all the way down to the coast. So you can see a little bit of change. We are still up in the high mountains. Atlantia purpurescens, which we will see later on in the national park. Quite variable. and uh, Tilancia limani, which also grows in Ecuador. Here it grows in a much drier area. And we did find that on the last trip. And as you can see, as we start dropping, the vegetation becomes very, very more desert-like because there's not much uh, humidity. Here you have like a field, but you have the river here. So this is all irrigated uh, agricultural land. And we start seeing more of this cacti in Neolimondia. And we uh, sleep on the little hotel on the coast near Trujillo. And of course, we are on the Pacific. And driving along the coast, I said, there's no vegetation here. This is more like a desert. And the first time I saw this, it was all nice dunes. And I go, well, what, what are those things growing over there? And I was surprised. There's three different species of Tillandsias growing mm -hmm. in the middle of the sand dunes. So people that think always of Tillandsia as something tropical, something very humid. And here we have three species growing in pure sand. Tillandsia latifolia, which is a species that can grow in the sand, but can also grow in the trees. And of course, it has a different shape, a different form of it. But just growing in pure sand. Tillandsia purpurea. Also growing in pure sand. And this is another Tillandsia, Tillandsia watermani, with the longest uh, spike on the inflorescence. So these three species, they grow side by side on the, sand, on the sand dunes. We usually stop there for lunch. 
And this is going inland, again, latifolia, a little different with more red bracts, mm -hmm. and a different form of Tulancia tectorum. Mm -hmm. And much more compact than we saw before, the one before had very long, uh, thin leaves. This was a different form of Tulancia tectorum. Tulancia purpurea, growing on rocks instead of growing in the sand. And another Puya, Puya serratenia. Uh, this is most likely Puya ferreira with the yellow flowers. And of course, the first uh, the first trip that we did, the main thing was to find this plant. And uh, as some of you know, this is Puya raimondi. Uh, not very spectacular here. I mean, this. The, the scenery is nice, uh, but this become a lot better once they are in flower. This is uh, the largest of uh, bromeliads, and we'll see more of them in flower on a, on a different part. Eutroconia longifetala, widespread, and very, very common. This is one of the national parks that we visit by Lake Yanganuko, with quite a few bromeliads growing here. A few puyas, we are about 5,000 feet in elevation. This is Tilansia Valteri. Tilansia Valteri usually has the bracts are yellow. So the first time I showed this to uh, 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 to Pam, Pam Coide, she goes, no, no, Tilansia Valteri has the yellow thing. And then I realized the yellow one is the most common, uh, but in this area, they're all uh, red and still the same species. The common form is the one with yellow. Uh, quite a few orchids grow here. Some, uh, uh, this is a Mazevalia, which was spectacular, the, the amount of flowers that he got. Uh, this is a Tilansia that I always try to identify. I, I haven't been able to. It's fairly common, but growing right next to the water, what you have over here, it's a little stream, and they only grow next to the water. Uh, I just recently, literally last week, I, I found the name for this Tulancia as a, a beautiful red uh, bracts on the spike. And uh, I never seen it with uh, flowers, so I, was I wasn't able to identify it, but I recently saw it and I will put it on the next slide. Um, also, the first time I saw this, and I go, I can't believe that we do it in a national park, they will have introduced Protasi here. Uh, but this is actually a Protesi is not just from uh, Southern Africa. It's a cosmopolitan family, and some Protesi they grow in Colombia, mm -hmm. Ecuador, and Peru, and this is one of them, Oriocalis grandifolia, grandifolia. <coughs> just the scenery around Lake Yanganuco. There's a couple of lakes. There's and a great trail that connects along the lake. Yes, yes, I've done the trail. There's two, la there's two lakes, and you can go from one lake to another. There's a quite a few nice trails to walk. Uh, this is a very nice uh, tree with a, uh, a very uh, distinctive uh, peeling bark, which is Polylepis sericea. Polylepis is a genus of trees that grow about 5,000 or 4,000 feet in elevation. They are very, very important for the birds uh, because they use it for nesting and the, the fruit is also edible for the birds. And it's literally the only resource that this, some of these endemic birds have. Uh, unfortunately, it's only, it used to be the only resource for the local people to have something to burn to keep warm in the winter time. So most of the populations of these polylepis have been, um, they're very, very in danger right now. Uh, there's about 20 different species. They, they grow all the way from Cordoba, Argentina, all the way up to uh, Colombia. I think there are some species that go over there. This is probably <coughs> one of, one of the largest. Polylepis, ah. Uh, I, I looked it up, and I can't remember. They're the highest growing trees. Huh? They're so the highest growing trees in elevation. Say that again? These are the highest growing trees yes, in this area. Yes, yes. Yeah, this and is that, like an over 10,000. Yeah, and, and that's why these plants are so important, for yeah. mainly for, sure. the, for the birds. The endemic birds, they do use this as a resource for food, and it's the only uh, thing they have. Now they have eucalyptus, but you know, they just plant it all over. But they, they grow a very, very high elevation. And we do lunch over there every time we go. 
you know, you're not there, but uh, you know this guy here. Yes, I do. And who is that man? Oh, there's Zhu. Yeah, there you go. Uh, a very nice passiflora here, passiflora cumbalensis. Very distinctive compared to other passifloras with a very distinctive fruit. And the lake is uh, always has a very bluish color, uh, sort of glacier on lakes. Tilansia pulporescens, color in the rocks, just a forest of them. It's the flower that is colored purple, not the bracts, the bracts are yellow. Another tilansia that grows next to the lake on the rocks but very low in the lakes, not covering the rocks and not very, uh, not a lot of plants. Tilansia ionochroma with a pendant inflorescence. Another puya, puya macrura. It is puya macrura. And some very nice uh, balls, uh, Bomaria uh, dulcis, and this grows above 11,000 feet in elevation. This is the highest point. And as you can see, we are at very, very high elevation with uh, permanent snow covering the mountains. So you got these two wide ranges. One of them is called Cordillera Blanca, obviously because of the snow, but the one closer to the coast, the snow melts and it's called Cordillera Negra. This is a picture from a hotel in the town of Oras where you can see the Huascaran Mountain, which is this one right here. And this is uh, pictures from around for us. Yet another population of Tilansia tectorum, very hard to reach. You have to actually do a climb. Tilansia latifolia, and you can see next to the river, you can see how uh, the locals use the irrigation and they have a lot of the crops growing next to the river. Lancia Valteri with a, a inflorescence that has a split, that's not common. And this is the first time that I actually saw Puya Raimondi. Uh, still far and uh, I just didn't know the best place to go. And this is when I, the first time that I saw it in a good place where you can actually drive the bus right next to them so you don't need to do much hiking. Now, uh, you can see they have the all inflorescence uh, with uh, sort of like the dead flowers right here and right here, and after they flower, the plants die. Uh, this, uh, it's called like, uh, like a, a, where many plants bloom, it usually matches the day where they have a Nina event. So I've seen this event twice, just by luck, having to be there the next uh, year after El Nina event, and that's when you have this mass flowering uh, event. Most of the times that you go, you only see maybe one or two plants in bloom, and you'll see the old spikes from our previous events where you see uh, many plants already with the dead uh, flowers. This is the, the tallest inflorescence in the world, and we are about 11,000 feet. And this is just a, a detail of the flower. If you look on here, every single one of these uh, things here has about yeah, 10 to 11 flowers. And it is visited and pollinated by hummingbirds. A giant hummingbird is the main pollinator of these plants. Did you see juvenile plants? Yes, plenty. Okay. Plenty. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, locals, the locals they use the, the, basically the trunk from the inflorescence to have these beans for the a little shelter. There's usually somebody selling snacks and sometimes sodas. But you can see the size of this compared to a person here. The person is behind, so this is easily 20 feet high, 25 feet high. So I don't see too many small ones, and when I've been there, I haven't seen seedlings growing oh, oh yeah. because I, I, of the... I have pictures of it. Uh, they, too, they say there when you go there that because of goats and... There's um, not many goats here. You don't, you don't see that many goats. They're sheep. They're sheep. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, here in this particular population, and you can see it doesn't grow over there, they're usually in clumps. Uh, so driving there, you'll see maybe clumps farther out, uh, and they're usually concentrated like this. 
but you do see small plants in the in the population. And I think I have pictures, and maybe I didn't put it on the thing, but you do see the small plants are growing it. But there are other places where they grow, right? In Bolivia or something? The, in Bolivia, there's two populations and there's 23 populations here. Mm -hmm. When I say population, this and the one behind, and this is considered one population. So there's 20 different, uh, 21 different sites in Peru uh -huh. and two in Bolivia. I visit the ones in Bolivia as well, and they're much smaller population than this. Mm -hmm. The botanic garden at Berkeley grew one of those. Yes. And it took 35 years before it bloomed. It bloomed. Uh, but, but I think it was helped. I think it, in the Andes, it takes a little longer to yes. bloom. <laughs> About the same time, or um, I don't know if you guys know Andrew Flower in New Zealand. Okay. But he planted one, and I think the only guy in New Zealand has ever been able to get one, and it took 40 years. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's under, you know, a little bit, with a little bit of help and maybe a little a bit of extra help. water. Uh, <laughs> here, they say that it take about 80 years to bloom, 80 to 100 years. <clears throat> anyway, we take the, the opportunity to have lunch next to this uh, nice place. And this is what they look like the year after uh, they flower. You have most of them with just uh, dead inflorescence. You will still find maybe one or two plants that, of course, you hike to them uh, to take pictures of the flowers and stuff. So it's just a matter of luck. And you can see all this, almost no flowering plants here. This is a different population. And uh, you can see here, they're just coming into bloom. They're, you know, they still haven't developed quite a bit. Just coming into bloom, so probably no flowers yet. And this is all the this is the giant hummingbird that looks small, but it's actually a fairly large hummingbird. And these are all the birds that actually uh, use uh, some parts of the plant for sheltering, for uh, uh, food, for foraging, or even for protection. Now the nice cactus that grows over here, or Oroya borchesi, yellow flowers, and Matucana jangunensis, which is. Uh, I think the name is, is being lumped into another name. And the other uh, cactus that grows in this area, Ostrocylindopuntia flocosa, with nice orange flowers. And a pollinator. So again, from Huaraz, we start heading down to the coast, to Lima. You find some more cactus. You can see, again, the vegetation gets very, very dry. You can see a little bit of fog but not enough to have a lot of bromeliads. This one is fairly common and it can go everywhere, Vitroconia longipeto. But you start seeing more cacti as you approach the coast. It's Postoa melanostele, with beautiful yellow spines, and more, it's the same, Vitroconia longipeto. And Echeveria, growing next to a water source. And this is uh, on one particular trip, uh, uh, one person wanted to see the other Arroya, uh, which is Arroya Peruviana, and from Lima we actually went on this valley uh, for a couple of days, you know, it's back and forth, I don't like to go back and forth because uh, basically there are not many stops when you go back on the same road. But we found this beautiful Tulancia growing next to the river. This is not a place that I usually uh, visit. It sort of looks like Tovarensis, but uh, it's quite far from Tovarensis. Anyway, some more uh, vegetation from this area, and some more Echeveria. All these Echeverias have been described by Guillermo Pino. So south of Lima, we go towards uh, Ica and Cusco afterwards. And again, all these mountains are very, very dry, very desert-like. And you see again, Tulancia latifolia, more cacti growing on these hills. And we are back again, crossing the Andes at 10,000 feet, Marningia candelaris. Very, very high elevation plants. And you'll still find Tulancia latifolia. So you can see very widespread. It adapts from uh, sand dunes to some parts that are more uh, tropical, more humid, or very high elevation like this one. Of course, you see some uh, uh, vicuñas. It's the Vicuña National Park. 
and again at 10,000 feet. And again, you see some more puyas over there, Puya Ponderosa. This is a very attractive Puya. We stay in this, uh, the little hotel is not a town. There's uh, this Italian guy that we met on the first trip. Unfortunately, he passed on a car accident because of ice on the road, but we continue to use the, the same place that uh, uh, we found on the first trip, which is exactly the middle between uh, Nazca and Cusco, so it makes it a very, very uh, good place to stop. And along the river, you find more Tilancia, Tilancia Caldesens. <coughs> this is in cultivation. I've seen it at uh, Rainforest Nursery. Beautiful plants growing on the side of the, of the road. Nice red bracts with yellow, uh, white flowers. It looks like a Yonantha. Yeah. <coughs> More Tulancia latifolia in a different habitat. And Tilancia cerulea, unfortunately there was a landslide and all of these plants were lost. I don't have another place to show it. But this used to be right next to the road and now it, the, the whole thing is gone. And normally when we go to Cusco, sometimes we stay in this place. This is actually the train station. And back in the days where the trains would, did not have a very reliable schedule, people will have to sleep at the train station. So the train station <coughs> will have rooms for people to sleep and it was uh, purchased by uh, a Canadian uh, uh, back in the 60s or 70s, a Canadian couple, kind of hippies traveling in South America, and they established themselves there, and now their son is actually running the place. Uh, but they converted the place into a very nice hotel. It's very convenient for the next morning to take the train if you stay there, because that's exactly where the train stops. And his, uh, their son have expanded uh, the hotel to the back. But anyway, sometimes we go for a little hike along the river and we'll find some more uh, nice plants. Tilancia caldigera, very soft leaves. And Tilancia palacea, in flower, growing next to the river. The ladybug. Tilancia nana which is not very common. And Tilancia micans or micans with uh, yellow bracts and white flowers. <coughs> Puya densiflora also grows next to the river. So you would go for like a little maybe one mile hike and we get to see five or six different Tilancia. This is a very unique uh, Echeveria, Echeveria westy. Not very common. And of course, if you are right there, we have to go to Aguascalientes and make a quick visit to Machu Picchu for the day. So I've been here maybe seven times, so normally I just go hiking. I don't go to Machu Picchu anymore, but most of the people will go. The bus will come from Aguascalientes and bring you to the entrance, which is right here. And people spend the day uh, walking around the ruins. This is a view from the Sun Gate. And Huayna Picchu in the back. And I have these pictures when I was uh, 18 years old. Yeah. Uh, I didn't put the picture, but I do have it. So I said I want to have the same. Uh, very nice sobralias, very nice orchids. The sobralias here have a very nice uh, colors. Most of the sobralias are usually whitish or pale pink. And these are very, very nice. And when I go on hike, I get to see this. Uh, this is a fairly new described uh, Tilancia Machu Picchuensis <coughs> growing on the walls. Tilancia Fendleri or Fendleri, very, very common when you take the train from, uh, uh, from Ollacaytambo to, um, to Aguascalientes. You can see, you can spot these plants all over the trees from the train. And Heliconia, so we go here, you can see it's quite uh, tropical. And we spend uh, just a day in Cusco with a very old architecture. Uh, as you know, Cusco was uh, sort of like the second city after Machu Picchu where the Incas were established. 
And once they, uh, the Spaniards got here, they pretty much tried to destroy everything that was built by the Incas, but there's still quite a few walls and the base of these uh, buildings, are, they still all have the, the base is all Inca structures and uh, um, with big rocks and big walls. As you can see, it's very well preserved, very clean compared to the first time I was here in 1982. It wasn't very clean, uh, but yeah, since it has become quite a touristy place, um, the place is actually really nice. And I used to take a lot of pictures of the locals. I don't do that anymore, but I used to take uh, a long shots with a long zoom. And uh, Peru is very distinctive that the hats, they actually can tell you where the, the people are from. This is a typical hat from Cajamarca. This is a typical hat from Cusco has a little decoration on the side, like that one. And anyway, I don't have any plans for sale, but uh, this is pretty much what's coming up for the next tours that I'm gonna be doing. Uh, we're gonna be going to Ecuador in July, then to Peru in September, <coughs> Argentina, Chile at the end of the year, and then we're gonna be going back to Socotra. Really? Uh, that's going to be since January, might be February of next year. Uh, we already done two trips to Socotra, uh, which some of you know have very, very interesting uh, flora because it's an island being isolated from the African continent for a long, a long time ago. Then Namibia in May, and we're going to be going back to Brazil uh, next year. By the way, if anybody's interested in Brazil, I will include a lot of pictures of the Encolurians and I'll be talking on Brazil on the, on the Cactus uh, meeting at two o'clock or 1.30. Uh, so you're welcome to come and, and uh, listen to the, the talk over there. And with this, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And